Join James and Teresa Merritt in beautiful Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, November 28th through December 1st for the 7th Annual Mountaintop Conference. Enjoy four powerful teaching sessions with your host, Dr. James Merritt, music and comedy with the Kingdom Heirs, a spectacular Christmas show at the Smoky Mountain Opry, even a fun-filled day at Dollywood. Don't miss this year's Mountaintop Conference with James and Teresa Merritt, November 28th through December 1st. Call 800-523-3919 or visit mountaintopconference.com. Today on Touching Lives. He is the one who took the time to come to this earth, to die on a cross for our sins, to come back from the grave so that we could spend time with Him today and eternity with Him tomorrow. Teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This is Touching Lives with James Merritt. If you've ever been to Washington, D.C., or if you haven't, you've ever get to go, one of the most important buildings in the world sits in this perfectly circular, well-guarded park in northwest Washington, D.C. Now, you wouldn't know it if you drove by there because it's really kind of a pretty nondescript uh, concrete building. It sits on the grounds of the U.S. Naval Observatory, and it houses the nerve center of the U.S. Directorate of Time. And the only thing that would let you know that the building must be a pretty big deal is because the windows are barred and it's very heavily guarded. And behind those windows, there are 28 clocks. Four of those clocks hold hydrogen atoms, and 24 of them hold cesium atoms. And those clocks are constantly bombarded by laser beams and microwave beams, and it causes those atoms to oscillate in an extremely incredible regular vibration. The results are measured by a computer, and every second they're fed into America's master clock. Now, those measurements in turn become the basis for all timekeeping in the United States, and they are sent to the International Bureau of Weights and Measures just outside Paris, which keeps the entire world on the same time. The reason why it's such a big deal is because there's one thing everybody in the world knows now, and we all know that time matters. And we've never lived in a culture where time has been more of a hotter commodity than it is right now, because we all know something about time. It is a limited resource. There are 24 hours in a day, but there are only 24 hours in a day. And the truth of the matter is, most of us struggle to fit all we need to do in time in a given day to do what we need to do in our work and in our family and with our hobbies and with our leisure. It's just tough to get it done. As a matter of fact, we like to prove to other people they're important because we'll say, I'll find time for you or I'll make time for you. And it's our way of saying, you know, you're, you're kind of a, a big deal for me. As a matter of fact, one of the most famous statements about time ever made was just developed about 25 years ago. We know what it is. Time is money. Nobody said that 100 years ago. You know what they'd have said? Money is money. But today we say time is is money. And so we try to be sensitive to other people's times. We will, you know, we don't want to monopolize your time or we don't want to waste your time. I mean, there's some of you out there, you're retired. You don't even know what to do with your time. You can't even fill up your time. You're just, you're totally bored. You're just totally lost. And, and the sad thing is there are a lot of us that frankly don't really understand how important time is until we're just about out of it. You go to the doctor, the doctor sits down, very grave look on his face, and he says, look, I I don't know how to tell you this, I'm just going to cut to the chase. You have a terminal illness. You're not going to live very long. Now, what is the first question that pops into your mind? How much time do I have left? Didn't think about it until we walked into the doctor's office, didn't give it a second thought. How much time do I have left? left. Now, let me tell you something about time and, and, and just being honest. If you're a husband, if you're, if you're a husband, time is like your wife. You don't tell time, time tells you. Okay? You don't tell time. Time tells you. Time tells you when something needs to be done. Time tells you where you need to be for a certain appointment. 
Time even tells you when time is up. You don't tell time. Time tells you. And this, all of this is to say there's something that a man by the name of Paul wrote 2,000 years ago that is so true and so very important. I want you to listen to what he wrote. He said this. He said, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, Paul said, there are only two ways you can spend your time. You can spend it wisely or you can spend it foolishly. You can use it or you can misuse it. You can manage it or you can mismanage it. There's a verse of scripture in Psalm 118, and it is amazing how much truth there is in this one verse of how, how to manage our time wisely. Here's what the verse says, very familiar verse. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. A lot of us have memorized that verse. If you can't, you can do it right now. Let's just say it together right now, ready? This is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. It is a fantastic verse because, believe it or not, in that one simple, single statement, there's this principle on how to get the most out of life. You ready? Here's the principle. The most important use of your time is spending most of your time on what is most important. The most important use of your time is spending most of your time on what is most important. So let me tell you what I'm gonna do. We're gonna just dissect that one statement of scripture right now this morning, and I'm gonna give you three simple steps to take every day of your life, and I guarantee you, if you'll take these steps when you go to bed at night, you'll be able to look back and you'll be able to say, I got the most out of this day I possibly could. I got the most productivity. I got the most pleasure. I got the most joy. I got the most happiness. I made this day the best day that I could. Three things. You ready? Here we go. Number one, approach every day thankfully. Approach every day thankfully. Now listen to what the psalmist begins by saying. He says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Now let me just stop right there. That's true of every single day of your life. Doesn't matter whether it's a rainy day or a sunny day. Doesn't matter whether it's a cold day or a hot day. Doesn't matter whether it's a good day or a bad day. Every day is a day the Lord has made. By the way, tell you what's interesting. The word there for made, that Hebrew word, is the same word that's used in Genesis 1 and 2 that, that, that was used for create. So really it says, this is the day that the Lord has made created. What the psalmist is saying is, just as God created a world for us to live in, God also created the time for us to live in that world on a daily basis. So in other words, every single day that you and I live is a God-given day. It is a God-made day. It is a God-created day. It is a gift of God, and we ought to be thankful for that day. Now, here's what I love about God. God does not play favorites. We do, but God doesn't. God doesn't play favorites. God gives the same type of day to everybody. Somebody put it this way. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, today is all we've got, and it is a gift from God. Listen, that's why we call today the present. We call yesterday the what? The past. We call tomorrow the what? Future. Future. But we call today the present. You know why? Every day is a present God puts under the tree of your life every single day. Amen. See, some of you got up this morning, or maybe you came to even last Sunday, and you know, and don't, please don't do this anymore after this message. You get up, and it's cold, and it's rainy, and it's dark, and you look up at God, and you say, I've got to go to church. <laughs> you don't have to go to church. You get to go to church. This is the day the Lord has made. I don't care what kind of day it is. Lord, you made it. You created it. It is a gift from you. I am thankful for it because when you live otherwise, you approach every day thankfully. Moses prayed this prayer. Listen to this. Moses said, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Listen, when you've got a heart full of wisdom, you will number your days. You know why you'll number your days? Because your days are numbered. You're not going to be here forever. And so every day that you get, be thankful for that God-given day. Approach every day thankfully. Step one. Step two, spend every day 
usefully. Now, listen again to the first half of this verse. There are two verbs in that verse. I'm gonna, I'm gonna emphasize both of them. Ready? Here you go. This is what he said. He said, this is the day that the Lord has made. So he's not talking about yesterday. He didn't say this was the day the Lord did make. He wasn't talking about tomorrow. He didn't say this will be the day the Lord will make. He's talking about today. Why, why is he talking about today? Because the only day you can ever enjoy is today. You can't enjoy yesterday. It's a memory. You can't enjoy tomorrow. It's just a possibility. The only day you get to enjoy is today. That's why we've got to be careful how we spend every single day because the time we have today can only be used today. Hey, let me give you an example. We, we talk about saving time or making time or borrowing time. You can't do any of those things with time. I mean, when it comes to time, think about it. You can't borrow from Peter to pay Paul. Now, here's the good news. I know most all of us out there really do desire to manage our time wisely. We really do want to get the biggest bang for the buck every day that we live. I know that, okay? Here's the bad news. Let's just be honest. Most of us don't do it. Most of us frivol away too much time. Most of us waste too much time. Most of us live in a constant state of frustration because we look back at the end of an average day and we go, I didn't get that done, I didn't get that done. Why well, wasn't I able to do this? Why can I not enjoy, not enjoy that? Because remember what we just read earlier where Paul said, making the best use of the time? That phrase, by the way, is an accounting term. It means to get the most out of your money. Now listen, God wants you to get the full value out of your time. He wants you to get the biggest bang for the buck in every minute that you live. He wants you to squeeze all the good that you can out of every moment of your life. So here's what I'm going to do. This is where I'm going to get real practical. I'm going to share with you this morning the biggest single key I've discovered on how to make the most of every day of your life. And it comes straight out of the life of Jesus. Because if you think about this, you'll agree with this. Whoever made better use of their time than Jesus? You understand he got everything done he was supposed to get done in three years? It takes some of us three years to read a book. <laughs> he got everything he needed to get done in three years. You say, Pastor, how did he do it? It's found in three words. Here they are. Important versus urgent. Now, stay with me. We're going to get a little bit deep. Just stay with me. What I'm about to share with you is not original with me. I didn't come up with this. Dwight D. Eisenhower, the former president, came up with what I'm going to share with you. Dwight D. Eisenhower said this, and it's so true. He said, what is important is seldom urgent. And what is, an urgent, what is urgent is seldom important. Now, here's what Jesus knew, and here's what Jesus did, and here's how Jesus lived. If you go back and you study the life of Jesus, here's what you'll find. He never let the urgent dominate the important. He never let the urgent take over the important. Let me give you an example. You may not know this story, a lot of you do, but he had a best, one of his best buddies was a man named Lazarus. Lazarus was dying. He knew he was dying. They sent word that he was dying. His sister said, tell Jesus to come quick. Our brother is dying. Now, the amazing thing is, when you read that story, had you and I been Jesus, we'd have said, man, I got to drop everything I do and I got to go heal Lazarus. The Bible says instead, he purposely didn't do it. Now, it was urgent that he go, but for reasons I don't have time to get into, it was more important that he didn't go. Jesus never let the urgent take priority over what is important. Now you say, all right, what is the difference between what's urgent and what is important? Here's the difference. Urgent tasks demand your attention right now. Got to do it now. These would be things like daily deadlines or emails from your boss or, or maybe a phone call you've got to return, okay? That's urgent. Important tasks contribute to your long-term goals. Things like staying healthy and physically fit. Things like getting your financial house in order. Spending time with your family. 
Developing your spiritual life and your walk with God. Now, here's why I want you, want you to watch this. President Eisenhower said, you look at every day that you spend, you will divide your life. You'll just automatically do it. You can divide any time that you spend into four categories. Ready? Here they are. Watch this. Category one, these are things that are important and urgent. They're important and urgent. For example, mamas, you got a crying baby upstairs. That's important and that's urgent. Okay? Can't wait. Handling a crisis at work. There's a real crisis at work. You're the boss. You're the manager. People are looking at you. That's important and that's urgent. Making sure you send your mortgage payment in on time every month, right? That's important and that's urgent. Okay, that's category one. Here is where a lot of us drop the ball, and this is where a lot of us get so frustrated. The second category is important, but it's not urgent. For example, I think all of us would agree that saving money for your future is important. Everybody agree with that? But it's not urgent. Um, getting enough exercise. Getting physically fit, it's important, not urgent. Getting enough sleep, it's important, it's not urgent. Spending time with your family, spending time with your kids, it's important, not urgent. And this is where we drop the ball because we kind of let those things slide because they're not urgent. Here's the third category. They're not important, but they're urgent. Booking a flight. Got to, got to fly out. It's not important, but it may be urgent. Answering a phone call. Can't tell you how many times in my ministry I've had people, I got to talk to the pastor right now. Right now, I got to talk to the pastor right now. And here's what I've learned 90% of the time. Number one, they don't have to talk to me right now. And number two, 90% of the time, somebody else can handle their phone call. See, it's not important, but it's urgent. Got to do it now, right? Or, or, or uh, returning someone's email, right? They send you an email, would you please respond quickly? Well, maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. So it's important, but it's not urgent, all right? Here's another area, though, where we really drop the ball. You ready? It's not important, and it's not urgent. Checking your Twitter account. It's not important. It's not urgent. Eating chocolate chip cookies. It's not important. It's not urgent. Playing video games, Call of Duty, it's not important, it's not urgent. All right, now listen, this is what I want you to lock in on, watch this. If the important doesn't get on your calendar first, the urgent will dominate your time. If the important does not get on your calendar first, the urgent will dominate your time. It is important that you don't let the urgent control you, it is urgent that you let the important control you. See, if you really want to really start turning your day around and get the biggest bang for the buck, let me make it real easy. Tell me everything in your life that you know is important. Put that big rock in the jar first. Good example. Great example. Everybody, I'll say this till the cows come home. I don't know where that saying came from. I'll say this till the dogs win a national championship. That's a lot more relevant to me. I'll probably still say it. It is important that you read your Bible every day, but it's not urgent. That's why a lot of you haven't read your Bible in a week. It wasn't urgent. Anything that is important, that's the big rock that goes in the jar first. So for example, see in my own life, whatever is truly important always gets top billion, top priority. I've told you this before. In my life, I'm going to do three things every day. I will do them today. There's three things I'm going to do. If I don't get anything else done in my life, I'm going to get three things done every single day. Number one, I'm going to read my Bible, pray, and I'm going to journal. I did it this morning. I got up early. I read my Bible. I prayed. I'm going to journal. Number two, I'm going to exercise. I'll go home this afternoon. I got to, I'm going to work out. I'll, I'll exercise this, this afternoon. Number three, I keep Teresa happy. Third thing on my list, whatever else I do, I'm going to keep Teresa happy. You know the old saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You know what I've learned? If mama ain't happy, the Holy Spirit ain't happy. So I'm going to keep mama happy, okay? That's my big priority in my life. So what I want to do is very simple. I want to encourage you today, if you really want to really start getting the most out of your life, 
Begin today to think about those things that you would tag as important in your life and begin to put those rocks first in the jar of your life. Now, there will be times, okay, that things that are neither important nor urgent, such as playing golf or watching TV or going to a movie, there will be times those things come up. You'll be able to do that. And here's the important thing. Then you can do them and enjoy them and not feel guilty because you know you ought to be doing something else. Now, here's the last thing we're done. Live every day joyfully. Live every day joyfully. Listen to the second half of this verse. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, let me just stop. There are no conditions to what the psalmist wrote there. He didn't say, you rejoice in the good day, but you reject the bad day. Because let's face it, one thing I'm going to promise you this year, I, I can't promise a lot of things, but I'll promise every one of you this year, you're going to have bad days. Matter of fact, I'm going to be conservative. Everybody in this room will, get, will have at least one bad day a month. Pastors get four. I promise you, there will be at least one bad day a month. But the psalmist is very plain. He says, every day that God gives us is a day we ought to enjoy, and we ought to enjoy the time that we get in that day because every day there's a rose you can smell somewhere. If you look for it, you'll find it. There's a rose you can smell somewhere. And what he's saying is, don't let the bad things that happen in a given day rob you of the joy from all the good things that happen every day. Because look, I get it. We're, we're all in the same boat. Days don't always go like we plan them to go. In a very typical day, I've got my to-do list, right? I've got important and not urgent, important, urgent, all that. Listen, my to-do get list, list gets interrupted just like yours does. I encounter things every day I have no control over. And I've given you some very solid principles today right out of God's word on how to manage your time. But I also know the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Sometimes the, the important that's not urgent gets interrupted by the important that is urgent. So your to-do list will get interrupted sometimes. Things will not always go the way you want them to go. You'll not always hear what you are wanting to hear. You'll not always experience what you want to experience. I get that. I'm in the same boat you are. Can't control them. But what the psalmist is saying is, from the moment you wake up and get out of your bed, you have a choice. And you can choose to enjoy the day that you have. Now, let me just say this. You may say, wait a minute. What about people lying on a hospital bed? Can't even get up. How can they enjoy the day God's given them? How about somebody that's in a wheelchair, somebody that's an invalid, can't even get out of a nursing home, can't even get out of the room that they're in? How can somebody enjoy that day? How can somebody rejoice? Let me just give you a few things. We can always rejoice that there's a God that loves us. We can always rejoice that there's a God that's in control of this universe. We can always rejoice that there's a God that said, I don't care what happens to you. I am big enough and good enough. I'll work it out for your good. We can always rejoice that we can be forgiven of all of our sins. We can always rejoice that we know we have eternal life if we know Jesus. We can always rejoice that at least I know today I can thank God and praise God and love, love God and serve God and worship God and obey God every single day. One of the greatest college football coaches of all time, without question, was Bear Bryant, Paul Bear Bryant. When Coach Bryant died, coached at the University of Alabama, when Coach Bear Bryant died, his wife was going through his wallet. She found something that no one knew about was there. It was a crumpled up yellow piece of paper. It was very obvious that Coach Bryant had folded it and unfolded it and read it and reread it many, many times. Nobody knew it was there. Never shared it with anyone. But it was so powerful. I said, I've got to share this with my people before I, I close this. This is what was on that piece of paper. This is the beginning of a new day. God has given me this day to use as I will. I can waste it or use it for good. What I do today is very important because I'm exchanging a day of my life for it. When tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever, leaving something in its place that I have traded for it. 
I want it to be a gain, not a loss. Good, not evil. Success, not failure, in order that I shall not forget the price that I paid for it. So I want to wrap all this up and say this. Time is very, very short. Eternity, very, very long. And what you do with your time in this life will determine the eternity you spend in the next life. So I want to say this without apology. I don't mean to upset you. I don't mean to make you mad. I don't mean to offend you. I just tell you, I believe this with all my heart. I believe every day of your life that you spend, that Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life is a wasted day. I don't care what you do in that day. I don't care how well you do it. Every day you live that Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life is wasted time. So, if, if you'd like to make the most, not just of today and whatever life you have left to live, but if you'd like to make sure that when time is no more and you've entered into eternity, you're ready to meet the God who created time, then the most important use of your time will be to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And let me tell you why. He is the one who took the time to come to this earth to die on a cross for our sins, to come back from the grave so that we could spend time with Him today and eternity with Him tomorrow. There are only two ways we can spend our time, wisely or unwisely. Making wise choices in how we spend our time leads to more happiness and far fewer regrets than when we choose poorly. If you need God's help in learning to manage your time in a better way, call Touching Lives at 800-413-1131 and let's pray together as we ask God for His wisdom. As a ministry, Touching Lives exists to make the greatest impact for God's kingdom that we can possibly make during this moment in time. But we don't serve alone. It's because of the faith-filled prayers and financial support of those who God has brought alongside us that we can do what we do.